Disclaimer. Opinions expressed are those of the content creators and do not represent any employer or entity. The information shared is for informational purposes only and should not be construed as medical advice or used in any legal capacity, including establishing standards of care. All efforts have been made to comply with HIPAA regulations. No guarantees are made regarding the accuracy of statements or opinions provided. Interaction with the podcast does not establish a doctor-patient relationship. Please enjoy this podcast responsibly. Welcome back to another episode of Pod Patrol with your host, Dr. Jeff Dykus. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Drew Lundquist from the Mankato Clinic. Thank you for joining me tonight. Thanks for having me, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. So talk about your roles of uh, what you currently do at the Mankato Clinic and how you kind of came to be in that role that maybe you didn't see coming. Yeah, so... I am the chief medical officer of the Mankato Clinic. We're a multi-specialty group. We have about 180 clinicians within the group. About a half are MDs, DOs, DPMs, and then the other half are our APPs. And we're a physician-owned multi-specialty group. And so I practice two half days a week, and the other time is spent doing administrative tasks. And like you said, it's not what I was planning on doing when I came out of residency, but it's something that has evolved and I really enjoy doing it. It's a, it's a fun thing for me. Yeah. So you went to Des Moines university like I did, and then uh, Detroit medical center, and then spent a little time out in, in Washington with Sig Hansen. Uh, talk about your experience, uh, both in residency and out in uh, Washington. Yeah. I, I mean, my, my training, I, I feel very fortunate, very blessed to do the training that I did at, at DMC. There was no orthopedics around. And so we moonlit for orthopedics. We did pretty much everything across, you know, a huge level one trauma center, huge. We were doing, you know, hundred plus hour weeks. So that was before the, the limits for podiatry. And we were right. throwing in tibial nails and doing all kinds of orthopedic things that were really valuable for me as a, as a surgeon and physician. And then, and then going to spend some time with Sig Hansen, that was, that was a month. And it was a really good month for me because I learned a ton from someone that I had always kind of held up as a, you know, kind of one of the forefathers of foot and ankle surgery. And so my time mm -hmm. out there was great. Yeah. And now you use almost none of it. Now I use very little of it. <laughs> I had to go back and get my MBA. I, I told my CEO when, when I was hired as a CMO of our group, you know, I pretty much said, Hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a trained physician, um, pretty untrained CMO. So I'd like for you to help put me through, uh, through a, a bit, some business classes. Cause I took zero business classes in, in undergrad. Um, right. so I, I got my MBA. Yeah. So talk about kind of what, what all that entails, chief medical officer of a, of a large multi-specialty clinic. And then you are the chief clinical officer for what's called stratum med. So talk about the difference in your Mankato clinic job and then what stratum med is and, and what your role is with them as well. Yeah, these are long conversations, Jeff. So being a CMO, <laughs> a CMO is is a title that is different in different places, but for a, a multi-specialty group like us and maybe like McFarland, because uh, I know a few people on, on your side, mm -hmm. we do privileging, credentialing. We take patient complaints. I do a lot of the watching out for our clinical quality. So, you know, overseeing a lot that goes on in the ACO and I say all of these things and all of these things take a big team. We have a really good team of from our CEO to CFO to our chief clinical officer, who's a nurse, and then two other directors who are nurses that really help us do a good job in all of those things. Because when you get that big, we have over 800 employees. We know we need to make sure that we have the systems in place, but we are a physician owned group. So we do give our physicians some autonomy, which is a, a blessing and a curse for everybody because you know, we get to treat people the way that we think we should. And sometimes that gets a little out of hand sometimes and we need to rein <laughs> people back in and to yeah. have that, that kind of pull between, 
you know, the physician owned being able to do what you want for patients and what's best for them and not being kind of owned by the big system. And sure. so it's a, it's a really rewarding, fun job. I get to have hard conversations with, with people. Um, you get to have good conversations with, with people and patients. I'll give you an example. When I, when I first started the job, I had two physicians who almost came to physical confrontations multiple hmm. times. <laughs> And I knew both of these people and they were, you know, well-meaning people, but they just did not get along. And mm -hmm. we had a series of meetings, you know, like these peace accords with these two and came out of it with them shaking hands and, you know, figuring things out. And so, you know, some of, some of the stuff is, you know, very clinical, like making sure that we're doing the right thing with whether it's breast cancer screening or, you know, colonoscopy outreach. Mm -hmm. Some of it's just helping people get along. So it's a, it's a varied job. Yeah. I think that's interesting because, you know, you spend your whole life, well, maybe not your whole life, but at least a good chunk of your life in undergrad and uh, podiatry school and residency and fellowship. And then all of a sudden there's this left turn uh, dealing with completely different things and trying to wade through that. Um, you know, I've talked about it before, how my wife kind of did that, maybe not to the same extent, but training. And then all of a sudden you're teaching and learning how to write test questions and, and be administrative. And it's just completely out of our wheelhouse. So kind of what made you want to take that left turn and, and, and do that compared to just continuing on in practice? I, I think it's, I think it's being in the right place at the right time. Um, our CMO before me was, so I was a division chair. So I was overseeing like the clinical, side and practice side of our surgical subspecialties. So podiatry, urology, ENT, ophthalmology, I had rheumatology and allergy in there, which didn't fit mm -hmm. very well, but it is what it is. Um, yeah. But she was retiring and I, I kind of looked over my shoulder and I don't know if I get a, you know, like a, an itch every once in a while to do something new. I've kind of found that I kind of feel like I need to add something new every once in a while. And it kind of came to one of those times and I, I looked around and I, I kind of thought, no one else is really stepping up for this. And I kind of would hate to work for someone else right now um, mm -hmm. in this. And I, I just thought that it was something that I was being set up for uh, just really being at the right place at the right time. So I, I went for it and it's been, it's been a great, a great change in my career. I still get to do clinical things. So still do ankle fractures, bunion surgery, you know, flat foot surgery. Um, I don't, I don't push the envelope too much clinically. I try to do what I, what I do well, um, just cause I'm not in the clinic every day, but mm -hmm. I find that very valuable because I need to be relevant because I need to know what's going on in the clinical world. So, you know, those, those struggles that we all have with documentation or, you know, the EHR or quality measures, things like that. Um, you know, I'm still, I'm still in that fight. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that, I guess that professional, frustration has led to a number of changes in my, in my career, whether it's, it's that, or, you know, looking at trying to start a device company or looking at that, the job you talk about with strata med. So strata med is a group of, of clinics that are mostly physician owned. Uh, it's about 17 clinics that come together and try to work together. We're part of an ACO, many of us, which is an accountable care organization. And we try to work together and not be redundant. You know, we found that a lot of clinics this size, physician owned, you know, if you want to do something new, you're, it takes a lot of organizational lift. So we try to do that across all of those organizations. I think we come into contact with about 12,000 physicians across those groups. So mm -hmm. that's another one of those kind of right place at the right time for me. Our, our clinic was a part of it and they were looking for someone and, um, they tap my shoulder and it's been a really fun ride for about the last year and a half. Sure. So my group is part of that and your group is part of that. And so that kind of helps us. Um, I mean, you can explain it better than I can kind of um, not get lost in the shuffle. Cause I think we're fighting against big healthcare conglomerates, hospital systems, private equity companies or firms, whatever you want to call them. Healthcare is changing rapidly. And so it's in the benefit of, the smaller 
group, quote unquote, because we are pretty big, many hundreds of physicians in each of our groups, um, but to kind of stick together, work together. What what are the benefits of kind of our groups working together? Um, do we get better insurance negotiations or, you know, you talked about the ACO. There's probably a lot of people listening who don't know what ACO means. So can you kind of explain the benefits and talk about what it, what an ACO is? Yeah. So, you know, in, in short, the benefits are just that instead of having, you know, a couple hundred physicians going out to find insurance rates, you have a couple thousand. And so you get, you get the benefits of, of pricing there and, mm -hmm. um, of having more clout really as a bunch of physicians that's, that are pretty influential and spread across the country. Right. And so, and then the ACO is a accountable care organization. It's a group of Medicare patients that are tracked by their quality and total cost of care. And so as, as groups, we have, you know, clinical quality questions and clinical quality metrics that we need to, to follow, whether it's outreach for colon cancer screening, every patient has to be seen once a year. Uh, and so we want to do that. And so we, we track those across all of the clinics and if we share in savings, so we don't spend as much money as we're supposed to, uh, we mm -hmm. get to share in that savings with the government. So if your patient is is a diabetic with an ulcer and you code them as a di diabetic um, without an ulcer that says to the the plan that, hey, this patient isn't that sick, but then when you do an amputation and they're uncontrolled and they need a pump and all this stuff, you know, and we had on paper that they weren't very sick, just a regular diabetic without complications, you know, that that doesn't line up with the the money that's coming in. but. If we code them as sick as they are, you know, diabetes uncontrolled, um, with an ulcer, with an infection, that kind of thing, then if we do a really good job in taking care of them and don't spend as much money, um, we can share in that savings with the government. I think as as physicians, we want to make we want to be sure that when we're doing really good care for our patients, that our patients win and get a good outcome, but also that we may you know, benefit from that by saving the whole system money. And that's one small step in that way. Yeah, I think that's an important takeaway there. So, you know, these patients are as sick as they are, right? And if we aren't documenting correctly, not not over documenting, but documenting correctly as sick as they are, then they have the, you know, I'm sure the actuaries behind the scene, the people that kind of calculate all this stuff can figure out, okay, with this set of population in this state with these diagnosis codes, we expect that they'll cost this many millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And if you come in below that, then they say, hey, you did a great job. We thought that it was going to cost us this amount of money, but you only spent this amount of money. So you must be providing better care. Now, whether that correlates or not um, with better care, I think is a little muddy there, but I think the intention is good in that we're saving healthcare dollars. We have the best intention of the patient in mind, which is, you know, performing the best quality care for the patient. So in my experience, it's been a good way for um, companies to, it, it's a little carrot dangled out there for the providers to say like, hey, are you documenting correctly? Are you doing the correct standard of care? Are we, are we utilizing healthcare dollars responsibly? Um, let's talk about, you mentioned it real quick that you started a, de a device company. So talk about, um, uh, your device company and, and why you decided to do that. Yeah. So my, uh, good friend and co-resident, uh, from back in the day, John Fisher and I, we were, we were talking about our Bunyan outcomes and we're like, man, in residency, you know, we didn't really see that many outcomes. We did a bunch of surgery. Uh, we fought, we followed in clinic every once in a while, but we really didn't see our outcomes. And so we started doing, you know, what we thought was really good bunion surgery. We were doing chevrons and lapidus. And I thought I learned a really good lapidus from Sig Hansen, which I did. But then I remember distinctly one, uh, lady, she was probably about 25. I did an Austin honor, did the, did the procedure really well. You know, sesamoids are all lined up right away. She came back. She's like, you know, this better do well because I'm getting married and we got to do all this stuff. And she looked great on the table, looked great first few post ops. You know, three months later, it's starting to slide over and those sesamoids aren't there anymore. And I'm like, man, there's got to be a better way. And mm -hmm. talked to John and, you know, we went through this whole process of 
looking at things and trying to find, and we started doing a transverse osteotomy um, at the metatarsal head neck area mm -hmm. and shifting it over. And we tried to find plates to fixate that. And we found one that worked okay, but then we had an idea to cannulate that. So our, our, our device is a cannulated plate that holds it while you're fixating it instead of trying to fixate it while you're trying to also move it. So we put it in the right place. We put the device down. And so we have a couple patents, the plate just came out and, um, it's, uh, it's been a good exercise for us to really see how, how things work. Um, mm -hmm. I think as a, as a physician, I really don't, I really want to do the best thing for patients. And I also want to make sure that I have some control over that. So, um, you know, some of these devices, when you work on them with other bigger companies, you do a bit, then they take it and make it into their own and they own it. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a bit of a thread there that I'd like to, you know, keep some control of that. And so we've been working that through it's out and, um, it's been a really fun ride. We're getting really good results with it. And it's, uh, it's something that another one of those outlets that I felt like I needed to do. Yeah. So what's it called? So Sky Surgical is the name of our company and we call it the Sky Ops Plate. Okay. So that sounds really interesting. I'll have to, we'll have to look into that. Um, one of your other roles uh, that you have recently moved into is working with an AI company. So uh, you are now the clinical, clinical director, is that correct? Clinical director of NABLA? Correct. Yeah. Clinical uh, director of NABLA. Which is an AI company. Why don't you explain it better than I can? Yeah. So uh, NABLA is a company that uses AI to help create notes. So it takes the conversation that's happening in the room between the physician and the patient and filters out all the gibberish about, you know, Vikings Packers games and, you know, how's your kid doing? And <laughs> right. It takes all of the things that are said in the room and then distills them down into a note. And so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I was a second clinician on their team. My clinic allows me to do this job because we want to have some say in these tools because this is really like, you know, I went to college when email came out and I, you know, had a cell phone and, you know, started calling my parents and grandparents and, I feel like we're in that moment of like, we know we're getting these tools. The phone has just come off the wall mm -hmm. and you know, it's about to go to iPhone 15. Um, yeah. We don't know what it's that capable moment. of yet. And yeah. We don't even, I mean, it's, it's changing so rapidly. I give a lecture on AI and the questions in the rooms have changed so much over the last year. You know, it used to be like, can we trust this AI big brother? Now it's like, can it, scan all my charts and tell me the next thing about my patient. Right. So it's, we've mm -hmm. gone from, can we trust it to what else can it do? And it's, it's a really, it's a really amazing tool that does it, it really helps my patient visits. Cause I sit there and talk to my patient like a human being, instead of scribbling down notes or trying to remember that thing that I forgot about that patient that I still haven't documented on three patients ago. Mm -hmm. So the mental burden on clinicians is something that it takes away and it's, it changes the way you practice when you no longer have to, you know, hang on every word or write that down or think, Oh, right or left foot. And it's all being mm -hmm. documented as we speak. I love it when the patient has their legs crossed and then I get confused. Wait, was that the right or is that the left? And then uh, I don't have to worry about that anymore. I just have Nabla and it'll remember what we talked about. So the idea is that you go into the room and you have this interaction with a patient, just like you would. And I've certainly had physicians, uh, doctors or been in residency and seen attendings with their face completely facing away from the patient and, and typing into a computer, like literally not even looking at the patient, just like typing into a computer, um, which I don't do because I don't think that's in the best interest of the patient. But the idea is to decrease the burden of medical documentation that seems to be probably the number one leading source of burnout in healthcare, I would say if you had to poll people, I bet there's lots of reasons for burnout. But I bet medical documentation is probably number one, if not 
you know, than in the top three or so. So the idea is that it's it's lessening the burden for physicians and, and allowing better interaction with the patients. So what have the results been like so far? Because you use this integration with your clinic uh, and your practice. So what what is the biggest change that you've seen after integration? Is it do the patients notice a difference or is it really just all benefit for, for you and time saving? So we surveyed all of our patients when we did our pilot for this. And we basically said, ask the patient, Hey, did you like how you just interacted with your clinicians or did you like the old way? And they far and away really liked the newer way of having your, your clinician talk to you um, and listen to you and kind of be focused on what they're saying. Cause it's a human interaction, right? I, I like to talk yeah. about trust as being our biggest commodity within healthcare. Yeah. Um, anything that we can do to increase trust because, you know, if patients don't trust us, they're not going to do what we say. Um, and, you know, it comes down to the question of, are we trustworthy? Of course, you got to be trustworthy and have your patient's best interest in mind. Mm -hmm. But then you, you have to be able to do things uh, in that patient visit to try to gain that patient's trust. And by looking them in the eye and asking them that extra question and having a clear mind as you are talking to them, not thinking about that last patient that you saw that you haven't documented on yet that you, you know, still need to put an order in that kind of thing. But it's a game changer. Um, I had an orthopedic surgeon who is retired in my clinic today and I've been in the OR with him. He used to get iliac crest grafts for me and mm -hmm. he'd always hand me way more than I needed, but it was always <laughs> a good thing, right? Yeah. Something you always want to have too much of is bone graft. Um, <laughs> But he was, he was in the office and I, 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 at the end of the visit, we had a long conversation about what was going on with him. He has a complicated medical history, bunch of foot surgeries. Mm -hmm. And I just turned to my computer, hit a button. And my, I said, I just finished your note. He's like, what? He's like, I just look at this. And so I showed it to him. He said, man, he was there with his wife. He's like, yeah, that's what did me in documenting. Yeah. He's like, that's right. what did me in. And she's like, yeah, he would go back to the office and document. I'm like, it just yeah. got done. That's so, crazy. So yeah, it's a, it's a huge burden on everybody. So I think an important takeaway from AI, not that we're at the end of the conversation, so I shouldn't take, say takeaway, but an important component of AI would be, I think that AI won't necessarily, so people are concerned, it, there's pros and cons of AI, right? There are significant benefits of AI. And then I think people can be a little hesitant to adopt new technology especially when you don't know potentially downstream ramifications or unforeseen consequences. I'm not necessarily talking about medical documentation, but AI in general. I think AI sometimes has this stigma of being like, you know, we've seen enough sci-fi movies of the robots being taken over by AI and taking over the humans and all that stuff. And so you see enough, you know, sci-fi movies and people maybe have a, and sometimes a negative connotation. So fighting through the negative connotations to describe to people, okay, this is what it is and this is what it can be. And these are the benefits. I think there are some probably physicians who are nervous that AI might replace them or replace a big component of what they do. But I would argue that it may not replace physicians, but it may replace the physicians who don't adopt AI. The, peop the physicians who are stuck in the past and don't adopt AI will be much easier to replace because they're going to have to see far fewer patients than someone who has adopted AI and can see a lot more patients because they're not worried about medical documentation. So I think the sooner people come to grips of embracing AI and what it can do and the positives, uh, the better. What are your thoughts on AI and, you know, the, the easy low hanging fruit is radiology, right? AI can read these scans and then do we need radiologists anymore? What are your thoughts on, on that and for better or for worse? Yeah, I think that's a great, that's a great way to say it. And, um, the CEO of Nabla told me that basic phrase probably about a year ago, cause I was thinking the same thing, you know, what? Where are we going with this? It's a little, it's a little frightful to have you know AI out there basically doing your job, and mm -hmm. you know this is a guy who he's been doing AI for twenty years. He 
sold a company to Facebook, used to work for Mark Zuckerberg pretty closely. And now he's starting another company. And then he said, Alex, you know, what, where's this going? And he said, well, you know, we don't, we don't think that we're going to replace physicians. We're going to, re- you know, those, those physicians who don't use it will be replaced just by sure. natural kind of selection. And that's, yeah. that weren't his words verbatim, but that was, you know, the, the sentiment. And I, I think that's exactly right. Is that, you know, we use technology to make things work better. I mean, if you want to describe it as like a, like a surgical thing, you know, if, why would you use crossing K wires if you can use a, you know, a locking plate and a compression screw on the first MTP fusion, right? Mm-hmm. You're going to, you're just going to get blown away if you're using the wrong stuff. Um, yeah. so AI is just a tool. It's just like a scalpel. Um, in some ways, you know, in the right hands, it, it's, it creates really good things uh, in the wrong hands. It can be used for harm. Um, so, you know, when it comes down to it, AI is a tool that we have to use to make us, ourselves more efficient and better clinicians. And yeah, I mean, if you're, if you're able to see a couple more patients a day and go home early to, you know, go do what you want to do, whether it's, you know, go work out or see your kids or, or do something, you know, it can, can really combat a lot of things, but yeah, of course we have to, we have to oversee it. We have to make sure that we check things. Our clinic just spent a bunch of time looking at an AI policy and it's a couple pages long, but the, the nuts and bolts of it are that we need to have it and all of the clinical groups looking at these things, make sure that they work well, but then the output needs to be checked by a a clinician. You know, we're Mm -hmm. not using AI to just diagnose. We're not using AI just to do our jobs. We have to use it as a tool and then check it because, um, and really it's because we need to communicate that to the patient who then is going to trust us to do the plan or whatever, you know, get the diagnosis, whatever it is. So yeah, yeah, we need to, we need to be a part of it. Uh, Yeah. I think kind of going back to the radiology thing that I was talking about, I heard a, heard a comment or a study that they used AI in reading images with radiologists and let the AI handle all the normal exams. Think about how many x-rays you get on a daily basis Mm -hmm. for heel pain, for sprain my ankle, but it's negative. Like how many normal x-rays or negative findings there are and using AI to kind of sift through all those normal, 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 normal. And anything that came back abnormal got flagged to the radiologist. And then the radiologist would go through those scans as, you know, the human interpretation of, of that information. So it gets a little hairy when you start getting out. Radiology is literally black and white in terms of when you're looking at imaging, do you see this thing or do you not see this thing? And when it gets into clinical diagnoses of what we do of feeling pulses and neuro exams, it gets way more complicated. And then that, you know, that lets us sleep at night because we, we start to think, oh, well, I can't do that because you know, so my job is safe. But I think that there's interesting components of all different types of physicians where maybe the goal is not to replace parts of that physician job, but to enhance parts of that physician job. Um, But I think it's interesting to think about how AI can integrate with different types of physicians, because we are all so different in, in what we do. Have you had any patients be hesitant to have AI be listening in the background or, or be involved in their, in their medical care somehow? We've had very, very few be hesitant. And, you know, we, we picked Nabla for a number of reasons. One of them is that they never have, they never have the entire conversation. They take chunks of it Mm -hmm. and deal with it. So that conversation is never one long conversation that's somewhere outside of our system. So it's very, very stable and very controlled. So it's not, it's not ever something where someone can just take that whole conversation and and take it. It goes up in little snippets. So it's kind Mm -hmm. of worthless um, if you were to hack it. Right. So so when, when I talk to patients about, or when I did, you know, we've, we've worked it into our workflow. So now it's just something that we do. But when we started, we, we talked to our patients about, AI. And I, we told them that, Hey, we're going to use a tool to help facilitate this conversation so that I can spend more time talking to you and not scribbling down notes or typing in. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it is AI and it's going to help create the note, but it's very safe. Um, 
I didn't tell patients, Hey, do you mind if big brother listens in on our conversation? You know, I, right. there's ways that you, you tell these things to people. And so, yeah. um, it was, it was interesting because when we first started piloting these, we'd have that conversation with every patient because we wanted to be very upfront what we were doing. But then I found that I'd have a conversation about AI for five minutes to each of my patients. And although that was kind of interesting, I didn't want to yeah. spend five minutes of every patient visit talking about AI. So we had to move right. past that, but yeah, you gotta, you, you gotta tell patients what, what you're doing. Um, but you also don't want to scare them. Right. You know, we, mm -hmm. we talked about, and I think surgeons honestly are really good at talking to patients about risks and benefits. Cause we know we deal with those all the time. We can do things that, that don't turn out. And so, you know, we have to tell patients honestly what could happen. Um, but then I'll also tell them, Hey, you know, if something bad were to happen, you know, it's only one snippet of the conversation or, you know, if it's an infection, usually it can be treated by an antibiotic. So, um, I think we have to talk to patients about it, but like, like, like we said before, those conversations are changing. Patients understand AI way more than they did a year ago. Yeah. I think that's part of it is just getting familiar with it. So can you talk about for those listening, what is AI? What is actually happening with AI? Because it's basically, it's a large language model. It's basically, it knows all of X amount of information, and then it's trying to coordinate that information and, and give it to you as succinctly as possible. But how do you and what do you envision AI? How would you describe it to a patient is like, well, what is AI? What's happening behind the scenes? How, do, how would you describe that to them? Yeah, so, you know, generative AI, you know, so AI that creates something based on the input, um, you know, a large language model is is just a incredibly large data set or group of conversations or you know if you want to talk about it as you know the works of shakespeare plus you know all of the books that were ever written um so you can say hey you know create me a we're talking more about you know chat gpt now um you know create me a a play in the tone of shakespeare you know about you know a, a two lovers that, that end up dying, right? You know, it, it'll create you something kind of like Romeo and Juliet, but maybe a little yeah. different. So, cause it takes all of the information that it has and then it can create something. So like for the example of documentation, the large language models that are out there, when you're having a medical conversation, it knows all of these notes, like it has all of these notes that that it has kind of stored and then in data form. And so it's using all of the words and L large language models are really like next word predictors. You know, you see them on your iPhone or mm -hmm. you see them when you're typing, it's predicting those next few words based on the words that you've typed and what you probably will say. Uh, it's just a predictor. And so the, the AI takes those conversations and then the, it'll even take, you know, conversations that happen at the end of a conversation about a patient like, Oh, Hey doc, by the way, I had both my knees replaced, uh, last year. And so it'll take that con that part and put it up into past surgical history, bilateral knee replacement, you know, 2023. So large language models are really just next word pr predictors. And then mm -hmm. what can be done is you can layer on these large language models on top of one another so that if you have a hallucination. And so a hallucination is really just where if it can't come to it, it will always put another word on there and they're getting really, really good to that. They're almost, you know, exact all the time, but a hallucination would be if it just puts a word that doesn't quite work because it had to come to an, an answer. Mm -hmm. Now you can layer another large language model on that, which can then filter that and then correct, correct it at the end. So, you know, they're kind of filtering on these large language models, these large data sets to make sure that you filter it through to something that, that comes out that is the output that you want. And so, you know, we can talk about prompt engineering, you know, the own, if you put in a prompt on chat GPT, that's what you're prompting the, the machine, you know, the AI to then create, and you have to make sure that you're prompting it with the right words. Um, so it's, it's an amazing, I mean, it's an amazing amazing technology that we're just really seeing grow exponentially here. 
Yeah, I think so. Obviously, just like anything, it's going to grow, adapt and improve with time. So we'll think of this as kind of level one of AI with the large language models. And that's really where it benefits us in terms of documentation. Uh, to my understanding, some of the newer components are multimodal AI. So instead of just understanding the written word, it starts to understand photos, videos, music, sounds, things like that, that you can incorporate. And I think that may open up the idea of the assistance of diagnosis. So I think that's kind of the inevitable future of AI. And the way that I've always kind of envisioned AI is yes, it will assist with documentation now, decrease time burden, burnout, that's wonderful. But the real benefit to me in the future is if there's an AI model running in the background that can see the CT scan of your brain 10 years ago and see the CT scan of your brain now, be able to compare the two, find this tiny little speck that humans miss because they're not going back 10 years ago to look at the CT scan, compare it to all the CT scans in the world and help facilitate diagno diagnoses for the physician as they're treating their patients. And then because they have access to all the up-to-date clinical trials to say, okay, you actually have this, this, and maybe less likely this, and here are the top three medicines that are in clinical trials right now. And the second medicine is actually showing to be the most promising. I mean, that holds basically, it feels a little fantastical. It feels like the future is coming, whether we're ready for it or not. But what are your thoughts on the utilization of AI to basically do what I just said and help formulate diagnoses with all of the information that's available? Oh, I'm sure it's being worked on right now. I mean, I, yeah. the, the opportunities in medicine are, are endless just because the amount of data that we have and the amount of understanding that we have of, of that data and then applications of it. So yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the opportunities are endless of, you know, looking through charts to say, Hey, you know, and the next thing for, you know, we have documentation now, which is kind of what we talk about as the low hanging fruit. Like that's an easy mm -hmm. application. It, mm -hmm. a, a year ago, it didn't sound easy. Now it's easy, right? Um, it's an easy <laughs> application, but what yeah. if that AI tool that's doing the documenting also has access to this patient's entire medical record. And as you're right. talking to the patient, it knows that they had a, you know, that CT scan that you're talking about. Um, and maybe it's suggesting, you know, a follow-up that was missed. Like, oh, hey, by the way, this patient has a CT that needs to be followed up on because we don't dig through all that information, right. like suggesting the next thing that could be done. Um, so, yeah, the opportunities are endless. And, and that's where our minds go, right? Like, okay. Right. We know, we know about documentation. Let's move on. Let's make this to where it can really be a tool to then help us in our, our next thing, next best thing for the patient, or how can it alert us to something that we're missing? Because I mean, I tell the story about almost missing a DVT in a patient who was, you know, he was like, I think he was like eight weeks post-op. He was walking around and he came in for an earlier post-op check, kind of in that weird area between six and 12 weeks. And He's like, ah, I had a rib out. I went to my PT and they're working on this rib that I have out. And I almost rid wrote him off like, you know, rib, uh, PT. I think he's going to see his chiropractor. Yeah. He's like, but when I take a deep breath, it just hurts. I'm like, oh boy. Mm -hmm. I look at his wife and she's worried about him. We send him to get a CT and he had a, he had a PE and a blood clot in his leg that was not, that I did not catch. Um, and I almost blew him off on that because he was being taken care of for this rib. I don't treat ribs. Right. Um, but I had a little more time and space. Um, and so it's like that time and space and that little extra information that, you know, clinicians, the documentation burden and the things that we have to think about, are there's so many things we have to think about. And if we can just take a few of those down and have a few tools that can help to push to make those decisions or alert us to things that we might miss. I mean, that's, that's, I think that's what we want. It makes our jobs easier. Yeah. Because not all doctors are created equal. We know that not all, plumbers are created equal. Not all concrete guys are equal, right? Everyone is a little bit different for better, for worse. 
And if you are a patient or your mom goes to see a doctor who happens to be not a very good doctor, well, that kind of stinks because you don't really know. You just go see probably the guy or gal who's closest to you or is nice and has good online reviews. And so it can only benefit the the vast, you know, landscape of medicine if it if you know what is it a a rising tide raises all ships Mm -hmm. and so if ai is integrated in all medical practices how could that not improve the quality of care across the board so i think that'll take a long time to get widely accepted and integrated and obviously it's easy for me to say this thing it's kind of like um you know if someone handed me a bunch of metal and said hey build a satellite it's like well, I know what a satellite is. I know what they do, but I don't know how to build a satellite. It's like easy for me to be like, oh, this AI model can do this, this, and this. And if someone was like, all right, go ahead and build it, I'd be like, I don't I, I don't know what, what even how to start. I don't even know what to do. So I think it'll take a while for those things to become, you know, available and then integrated. But that is, I think, a very noble goal. And I think if AI gets framed in the positive light as we move forward with the the utopia or the ideals that it may provide, I think it'll help with integration along the line. Because there are still people who, you know, have a flip phone because they don't want, um, you know, to download apps. And there are people who still have a rotary dial phone because it's what they've always had. So there'll be some physicians and whoever that don't integrate with this, but I think that it will benefit patients in the long run if there is widespread adaptation, adopting, not adaptation, but adopting of Mm -hmm. AI in their medical practices moving forward. So what's your goal with Nabla? I mean, obviously it's proving that it works, which it does because you've used it, you've trialed it, and then it's integration into, into medical clinics and growing that. So what are your goals as as being part of that company? Yeah, I'll say I'll say my goal as a clinician within an AI company is to make sure that we're applying these to the to the needs of the patient and the physician first and foremost. And then, you know, a the applications of AI to those things that we're talking about because, you know, once we have people using it for documentation, then we want to be able to use it for other applications, whether it's, you know, scanning the medical chart or helping with HCC scores or, you know, predicting things, um, you know, the opportunities are endless. So um, I, I was just thinking as you were talking that if I go back and listen to this in three years, I'm going to sound like, you know, total simpleton, right? Cause we're going to be talking about like, it's like talking about the, yeah. the internet, right. As it came yes. out, all those news. Clips. Right. So, Yes. Note to self, I'm going to go back and listen to myself right. ramble on about stuff that goes on so so quickly here in the next few years. But, um, you know, as a, as a clinician, you know, Nabla as a team, I think the it's a group of really smart people who are really trying to help to apply AI to healthcare. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a really fun group to be a part of, really smart crew. Um, I think one of the things about being a physician and talking to people within tech who are trying to do things within medicine is that, you know, and this is something I think for, for any physician listening is that, you know, the things that you know, as a clinician, the workflows, the, the knowledge that you have, you know, that is all so valuable to so many people out there because the understanding of clinical care and the workflows that go on within medicine, um, you know, there's probably someone out there who's trying to fix one of the problems that you have that maybe you haven't even thought of that as being a, something that's slowing you down or impeding you. But there are people out there that are working on those kind of things. And so, um, you know, it's been it's been really eye opening for me as a physician and surgeon to, to meet people who are working on a lot of the problems that we have within medicine. And there's some super smart people in there. So I you know, I look at it as kind of being that conduit between, between tech and healthcare. Um, because if you can have those conversations, um, with people who are, who are trying to help you, right. And then kind of guide them. I think that's kind of the thing that, that, that I always talk about the next, the next generation of physicians are going to have to 
you know, look smart on video. They're going to have to communicate with patients through multimodal channels. Like you're going to have to be able to be out there and give patients information in many different ways. And you're going to have to use technology that you didn't even know existed when you came into medicine pretty quickly. Right. Um, right. So I think having a wide eye, a wide breadth of information and things that you look at as you're going through your training programs or as you go into practice, you know, we have to, we have to have our eyes open and use those tools and talk to people that are working on things. And so, um, I'm big on having conversations with, with people that you run into on LinkedIn. Like that's why I'm so heavily into LinkedIn is that I, I'm able to run into people that are, that are working on things that are interesting and useful and having conversations with really, really smart people, you know, every week by doing that. Yeah, absolutely. So going back to AI for a second. So I saw a study one time that, um, or maybe you mentioned it on the podcast. I can't remember where I heard this, but they compared AI to some real life physicians and a, a, a certain number of patients preferred the AI because the AI was actually more empathetic or seemingly empathetic than the actual doctor. So I think that's an interesting yep. component. If, if AI can be more empathetic and more, um, you know, create more of a connection. Have you ever seen the movie Ex Machina? I've heard of it. I don't know that I saw it. So it's an interesting movie where a tech billionaire creates this AI model, like a, a robot basically. And a guy wins a sweepstakes to come and stay there and live there for a while. And it's basically a giant experiment to see what would happen. And the guy ends up falling in love with the female AI robot because she was so convincing that he turned on the human and sided with the AI point being of all that really good movie. If anyone hasn't seen it, sorry, I just spoiled it. Spoiler alert. It's from like 15 years ago. So you should have seen it already. Um, <laughs> but can we train AI to be empathetic? Can we train AI to, um, be compassionate or do you think that always will be the role of the human provider utilizing AI to make themselves better? Yeah, no, it's a new England journal of medicine study and I'll send it to you. And it is far and away that humans prefer the bedside manner of, <laughs> of an AI bot to real clinicians yeah. far and away. Um, what city no were they in though? Were they in like New York or were they in like, you know, the Midwest? Cause there's a big difference between bedside manner between some places. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. I, need, to, I don't know the detail. I, need to I know, know where the study the was done on that, but it's, but uh, that's really interesting. It is far and away. And so I, I think, um, I think it's exactly what you said that I think clinicians will need to use it to be more empathetic. Um, just like we use it to kind of clean up some of the grammatical errors on documents. Some people are going to be, like you said, some people are very good clinicians in some ways and some are not in, in others, right? Some people have bad days and they're more brusque with, with people. And so, yeah, we're going to, we're going to have to use it in all of those different ways to, to gain trust. And that's really the point. Like if you're using AI to just kind of get a patient to do something that they shouldn't do, uh, for your own gain, like you're not going to be trustworthy, right? You're, you're still going to fall on your face. Um, but if you're using AI to, for the best of the patient, I think they'll understand that. Um, yeah. is Nabla available to anybody, even a, a sole provider, private practice, or does it have to be a big group or how would someone who's interested in the technology trial it or, or figure, or go ahead and uh, get started using it? So the short answer to that is yes, Nabla is available to big systems on Epic. Nabla is available to single clinicians um, in their own office, private practice. So Nabla is something you can sign up and get started. You can do a, a free trial for 30 visits. Um, you can just go and sign up and you get going within really, honestly, like five minutes. You can start using it. Um, hmm. You can copy and paste it over into your, your EHR. 
you sign a BAA with them. So it's HIPAA compliant and it's all kosher and good to go. Um, very, very high quality notes right away. So uh, the long story on that is that not all tools do that. Um, and that's one of the, the reasons that I came to Nabla is that I talked to a lot of the founding teams of these AI tools and a lot of them were, you know, okay, we'll put you through training. We'll get you up and running on the tool. If you sign all this and go through the training and I talked to the Nabla team and they're like, you should just get off the call with us right now, go start and try it on your next patient. Um, so Nabla is, mm -hmm. you know, it's like $120 per provider per month. Um, really high quality notes, really customizable. So you can, you can tell the, the note model that, Hey, I want maximum detail on surgical discussion, or I want maximum detail on this part of the note. Mm -hmm. And you can put it in a soap note. You can put it in a paragraph note. You can put it in a like bullet bulleted type of note. Um, so it's very customizable because we put it across multi-specialty groups and we want it to be something that works and is customizable for really every specialty. So at that price point, $120 a month, if you, if it enabled you to see one and a half, maybe two extra patients per month, it's, it's paying for itself essentially. Right. Correct. I mean, that feels very reasonable, especially for people who, you know, if you see um, no judgment at all, but if you see, you know, um, 15 patients a, in a whole day, then okay, you can probably get your notes done. But if you're seeing, you know, 30, 40, 50 beyond that, I mean, this is kind of a no brainer to me. It doesn't have to be this one. We're not, I'm not, it's not a spokes model thing, but like good products rise to the top, right? So go try this, go try 10 others and figure out which one works for you and integrate it into your system and start getting the benefits of that. So um, I think, you know, people adopting it it's, it's probably one of those things, you know, people get so attached to their devices, you know, I can't leave the room without knowing where my phone is. Um, you know, what if I get a call? What if the ER calls, whatever, but you just get so attached to your devices. I think this is probably one of those things that when people start using it, if they ever had to go back to not using it, they would really not like it. They'd get so attached to the functionality of that, that I bet that they would um, struggle going back the other direction. So um, I think this has been a really, really interesting conversation. I'm, I'm very interested in AI. Like you said, everything that has flown out of my mouth will probably sound silly in the next six months or sooner. So we'll have to have you back on in the future and, and keep talking about this stuff as it, as it continues to adapt and, and grow. But I think it's a really interesting component of healthcare. You know, we're biased because we are in healthcare, but I think that because of the, the direct benefit that it can provide to patients, you know, it's one thing for chat GPT to write your term paper in college. Okay, great. You didn't really help anyone, but when you integrate it and it starts helping diagnose people sooner or better or more accurately, I think that the, the opportunities for AI are, are really endless. So I really appreciate you coming on tonight and talking about these things. Yeah, thanks for having me. And yeah, I'll come back in, in six months and make a bunch of corrections on the things that, uh, <laughs> that we were wrong on. <laughs> yeah. no, anytime. Absolutely. All right, Dr. Drew Lundquist, thanks for joining me on this episode of Pod Patrol with your host, Dr. Jeff Dykus. We'll see you guys next time.